Okay, I'm speaking uh, to uh, this uh, four part series of supplements, uh, which ran in the weekly worker uh, between <clears throat> March the 17th and April the 14th uh, this year. Uh, we didn't run it because uh, we thought it was good timing to run a rather abstract uh, analysis of um, uh, uh, imperialism and the political economy of the state. We ran it because we were desperately short of copy on March the 17th and I couldn't write. And so we took uh, work which was in progress, which had been sitting on my desk for, <clears throat> or rather on my desktop computer for 10 years or thereabouts and uh, cut it up into pieces and, and printed it. Also background, uh, this book, Karl Kautsky on colonialism uh, is, uh, uh, Kautsky's uh, 1896 series, uh, Colonial Policy, on colonial policy and um, past and present colonial policy and my uh, fairly long uh, introduction to it. <coughs> so I'm what I'm going to try and do, and it's not going to be easy because uh, as you can see by the length of the uh, uh, series, it's uh, a, a lot of pages. I'm going to try and give a skeletal outline of the argument of uh, these pages, uh, this of the series. I start with the proposition, what do we mean by imperialism? Yeah. Uh, imperialism is a tag for a systematic holding of other countries in subordination by uh, states. I'm saying countries for ambiguous because full colonialism involves holding countries in subordination rather than holding states in subordination. In reality, on the other hand, a lot of imperialism is about one state holding another state in subordination. And this was, of course, already true <clears throat> when the East India Company, with the backing of the British state, acquired the right to levy taxes in Bengal uh, by grant of the Mughal Empire. Uh, they were what was involved was the British state through the East India Company holding the Mughal Empire in subordination. Um, in capitalist imperialism, as distinct from uh, both the imperialism of ancient Rome and ancient China on the one hand, and the expansionism of the Middle Ages on the other hand, the consequence of imperialism is that the subordinated country has also has its economy subordinated to the interests of the metropolitan country. Mm -hmm. And uh, typically, uh, this involves uh, the, the subordinated country being uh, pushed to specialize in low value added operations. Now, tip, again, typically agriculture and extractive operations. And then uh, the idea is that the efficient division of labor is for the subordinated economy to engage in agriculture and extractive operations, which supply um, uh, raw materials to the industry of the uh, imperial, of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the superior country. Uh, it can equally be uh, Maquila Doras, uh, that that's, uh, was the phenomenon in uh, 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 Mexico in the uh, first phase of US offshoring of um, large assembly plants, which were wholly dependent on uh, US production operations being set up in uh, Mexico. I think that the Maquila Doras have largely all shut down and moved elsewhere, but it's a convenient name. And in a sense, actually, that's also true of what's going on with Foxconn uh, in China and uh, a series of other uh, operations of this sort. What we've got then is uh, that the subordinate country uh, is, has its economy pushed to specialize in low value added operations. Whether those low value added operations are uh, simply extractive or are uh, the parts of the uh, production chain which are mere, which are relatively low value added or labor intensive. Mm -hmm. the, net, the fact that we call this imperialism is uh, a, a more or less purely a historical thing. 
Uh, it results from uh, Benjamin Disraeli uh, in the 1870s. Uh, the background to this was that uh, the uh, French state characterized itself as imperialist, by which it meant that it was Bonapartist. It was the inheritor of uh, the empire of Napoleon Bonaparte. And uh, the uh, German new unified Germany had characterized itself as the restored Reich, that is, it translated into English, the German Empire, which of course had been called an empire uh, because uh, the Pope in 800 AD crowned uh, the King of the Franks, Charlemagne, as Western Roman Emperor. And uh, as a result of that uh, coronation, uh, and the subsequent evolution of uh, France and Germany and uh, Lotharingia, the uh, middle countries, um, it had become the case that the imperial title had become attached to the Kingdom of Germany. Um, so Germany was the Holy Roman Empire, and that continued to be uh, the case down to uh, the early 1800s when the Holy Roman Empire was abolished and the Austro-Hungarians attributed the name of empire to themselves. Um, so Disraeli, in this context, uh, if what Disraeli was in fact doing with uh, imperialism, and in England is an imperial country, uh, was saying, we are also an empire, just like the French and the Germans, we, are, we too are an empire. And what he did with the Royal Titles, what they did with the Royal Titles Act 1876 was that uh, Queen Victoria became the Queen Empress, Queen of England and Empress of India, uh, which was not a totally unsenseless thing to do, say, because, uh, of course, the British state had taken over the holdings of the East India Company in India after the uh, Indian uh, first Indian, the Indian War, of, uh, failed Indian War of Independence, which is commonly called the mutiny. Um, and uh, so imperialism in that sense uh, was uh, Tory party's vote winning policy of uh, the Tory party uh, from uh, the 18, early 1870s down to um, uh, uh, really Actually, I, I'm trying to think when it, the, the open imperialism and down to Macmillan, in essence, in the 1950s and the retreat from empire. Mm. In that context, what had previously been called colonialism or colonial policy uh, began in the debates of the Second International to be called imperialism. And in that context, we have uh, the development of a theory of imperialism, which was initiated by Ernest Belfort Bax and then adapted and developed uh, by uh, Alexander the Elephant Parvus, whatever the hell his real name was, no, nobody knows, um, uh, other than that he was Israel Lazarevich something. Um, and Parvus's theory was then picked up and developed by Hilferding. Uh, in his book, uh, Finance Capital in 1910. And uh, Hilferding's book was used as the uh, primary basis along with the English liberal Hobson uh, in imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. And there were in the Second International two alternate, the, 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 the essence of this theory was that um, uh, due to underconsumption, uh, capitalism was heading for uh, uh, under the underconsumption of the working class meant that capitalism was heading for a Zusammenbruch, a general breakdown, or Kladderadatsch is another way of putting it. I will put those up when I have time. I'll put those up in the chat. Uh, and that averting general breakdown, what was being done to avert general breakdown was to create cartels and monopolies. Uh, and uh, imperialist expansion in order to provide overseas markets for the cartels and monopolies. And the consequence of the uh, overseas expansion was uh, colliding expansionist empires, uh, which was going to lead to uh, world war. And that it was going to lead to world war was something which was uh, understood in the uh, 
at least the German SPD and probably the Second International more generally by 1900. Uh, and uh, two alternative theories existed. Uh, one of which is uh, Kautsky's, which uh, we have the beginnings of in this Karl Kautsky on colonialism. Uh, Kautsky argued that uh, Britain was not imperialist. 19th century Britain was not imperialist. Uh, it was characterized by uh, advocacy of free trade, liberal free trade and so on. But that France and Russia in particular were imperialist and Germany was beginning to be imperialist and that France and Russia were imperialist because of the dominance of the pre-capitalist classes and in particular the aristocracy and imperialism was about providing uh, uh, sinecure jobs overseas for the children of the aristocracy and about monopolies which were the product of uh, early capitalist proto absolute capital quote capitalist absolutism um, the third theory, and uh, Kautsky then, uh, therefore, it, it's out of that that Kautsky grew his position, which said actually capitalism has got beyond wars, uh, and very regrettably, Kautsky's argument that capitalism has got beyond wars turned out to be published in August 1914. Um, the hyper-imperialism, generalized international cartel. The theory has been revived in our own time by the uh, Atlanticists for workers' liberalism. Um, the third theory is Luxembourg's theory, which is also Luxembourg's theory is in a sense also a theory of capitalism, imperialism growing out of early capitalism uh, in the sense that uh, Luxembourg theorized uh, that capitalism always requires a non-capitalist market, that the underconsumption of the working class is such that capitalism in all periods can only survive if there is a peasant market outside of the, uh, 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 class, the, the, the core capitalist classes. And the necessity for this peasant market outside of the core capitalist classes then implies uh, the necessity for capitalism uh, to expand overseas, but to expand overseas not in the sense of um, uh, expanding overseas uh, it, it, to provide a market for the overcapitalized industrial production sector, but in the sense of holding the colonial countries in the state of being a peasant market. Yeah. So Luxembourg's theory, as I said, is it was not very popular at the time when she wrote it, but it was very much um, ha had ha very heavy influence on the uh, post Second World War left, uh, because it seemed to be a better expl explanation of what came to be called the development of underdevelopment. Uh, that is to say that um, uh, the colonial countries uh, don't in fact develop into rival capitalist countries, uh, but are held in subordination. Mm. Now, this is, yeah, now, um, what my uh, long series is about is uh, let's co let's call it speculative political economy. I want to be very clear: it's highly speculative political economy. Uh, it's not uh, based on the lots of hard empirical evidence and numbers. Uh, it's trying to work out uh, why it should be the case that capitalism is invariably accompanied by uh, imperialism in the sense in which I've just said that you hold, while well, some states hold other countries in subordination and those countries which are held in subordination, their economies are adapted to the interests of the uh, uh, superior country. My reason for doing that, and I, again, I've argued at that the historical point in the introduction to the Kautsky on colonialism book, uh, the belief that uh, uh, British imperialism was not 
British, the British capitalism was not imperialist in the high period of free trade is just bollocks. It is the most spectacularly, it's, it's not actually um, Katsky's own original bollocks, it's um, Max Beer, uh, who wrote a, uh, uh, a piece in the Neue Zeit uh, before Katsky's series about the revival of British imperialist ideology. Now, Beer was clear enough that 18th century writers saw England as an empire. Yeah. Um, and he was clear enough that he was talking about ideology. But Kautsky drew on Beer's argument to suppose that industrial capitalism, as opposed to mercantile capitalism, uh, is not imperialist. Yeah. And that's the, the, the gist of, the, uh, of, of, of Kautsky's argument. But the argument that there's a, a non-imperialist period of the British state in the middle of the 19th century is just complete bollocks. There is no such thing. The fact that the uh, uh, Manchester Liberals uh, political economy guys said imperialism is a waste of money it was loud ideological statements, but had no impact whatever on the actual colonial operations of the British state. The colonial operate acquisitions continued apace throughout the period, which was supposedly dominated by free trade capitalism. And uh, moreover, uh, the British state was a free trading state. It was, well, it was a, a free trading state uh, after the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846. Uh, but this free trade policy was a policy uh, uh, of mercant for the mercantilist advantage of the dominant British shipping industry, just as the Netherlands in the 17th century had pursued the policy of uh, mare liberum, the seas are free, in the interests of the world dominant Netherlands shipping industry. Free trade is not a non-mercantilist policy, it's a mercantilist policy in the ex in interests of existing dominant industries or existing dominant uh, 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 financial structures. Mm -hmm. So my theoretical problem then is to explain why it should be the case that actually we've got the same phenomenon of holding other countries in subordination um, and states, states uh, experiencing sharp rival, capitalist states experiencing sharp rivalries among each, amongst each other leading to war, et cetera, et cetera. In late medieval Venice and Genoa, in uh, early modern um, Netherlands, early modern England, 19th century England, uh, in the war period of the uh, first half of the uh, 20th century, and actually also within the period of dominance of US uh, capital uh, in the second half of the 20th century in the early 21st. So it's the explanation that explains it as being something which arises because of the um, early development of capitalism, a la Kautsky, is not going to work. And the explanation that it explains it as something arising because of the overdevelopment of capitalism, which was the Bax, Parvus, Hilferding, Lenin explanation, also isn't going to work. It doesn't explain the fundamentals of the history. So my starting point then is that uh, we need, in order to explain uh, imperialism as a phenomenon, we need a political economy of the state, a capital, we need a, a, an understanding of the relationship of the, cap, of the capitalist state to the capitalist political economy. Mm -hmm. That isn't there in Marx. He intended to do it at some future volume of one of, I can't remember how far down the track in the uh, plan in the uh, contribution to the critique of political economy and in the plan in the Grundrisse. And in fact, uh, he said uh, in one of his late interviews that it was capital is an incomplete part and there's going to be stuff about the state and foreign trade and credit and so on in the future. Yeah, but he never delivered on it. And what he delivered uh, was uh, simply uh, uh, adaptations of Hegel. Um, uh, we need both sides 
first we need, we need both sides because imperialism is a set of relations between states and involves state action. We also need the capitalist political economy aspect of it, because as I said, and I'm just going to say it again, capitalist imperialism is different from medieval expansionism and is different from uh, ancient empires. Yeah. It's different from the ancient empires because the ancient empires characteristically spread uniform relations of production up to the hard boundaries, the Great Wall of China, the uh, Le Roman limes, around the various uh, territories and so on and so forth. Yeah. You can find villas of the exact same sort, villa territories of the exact same sort uh, in North Germany, in uh, West Northwest Germany, in in, in uh, uh, Midlands and Northern England, uh, in uh, Southern Turkey, in etc. 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 There's a sharp edge between uh, the uh, empire on the one side and the barbarians outside. That sharp edge uh, in the end collapses the empire because the empire, the barbarians outside are uh, hostes, enemies who are liable to be enslaved. And uh, the uh, habit of the uh, private slave raiding across the borders uh, produces state formation on the other side of the borders and uh, retaliatory raiding into the empire. Is just as much true of the other of the Chinese state as it is of the uh, Roman state, yeah. and but it's not the case that the uh, state creates institutional structures of subordination of the relations of production in the uh, colonial territories to the uh, imperial centre. Secondly, it's equally true, and the R forty or right true, all the more true of medieval expansionism. In the Middle Ages, the incentive structure pushes the peasantry uh, to have more kids and actually pushes the landlord class to have more kids as well. And the result of that is land hunger of the peasantry and land hunger of the landlord class. Uh, the uh, um, church doesn't have quite the same thing, but we get uh, pilgrim hunger, the, the desire to attract tourists, uh, religious purpose tourists to your uh, church rather than other churches. Um, I don't think that's actually driven by the internal dynamics of the church, but by imitative behavior by abbots and priests and so on in relation to the landed aristocracy. The result of that is you get uh, very substantial episodes of expansionism. So the Drang nach Osten in Germany is a colonizing wave of Germans creating uh, towns and castles and uh, so on in large parts of what's now Poland, Czechoslovakia, um, Hung uh, uh, Austria-Hungary, um, and so on. And um, uh, analogously, we have in uh, Spain, the Reconquista this is a, not just a uh, forcible reconquest of Islamic Spain, but also a colonizing movement of uh, Catholic peasants and landlords into uh, southern Spain. Uh, in England, uh, the uh, landed aristocracy move into Wales, and they move into Ireland, and they move into Scotland. Mm -hmm. And uh, the peasantry similarly. So we have this expansionist dynamic, but the effect of this expansionist dynamic, again, is not to create radical subordination, even of Wales you know, in the Middle Ages. I say even of Wales because the, the best argument for radical subordination would be in relation to Wales. The, the result is to create feudal Wales and feudal Scotland. And in Scotland and in Poland, the demonstration is clear that the feudal Scotland and feudal Poland can stand off the um, uh, English and can stand off the Germans, that uh, this is uh, not creating standing inequality. In contrast, um, Venice 
creates uh, slave plantation colonies growing sugar and doing initial sugar processing operations uh, in uh, Crete and Cyprus. Venice sets up uh, naval bases all around the Eastern Mediterranean and into the Black Sea. The same thing is done by Genoa. Genoa takes on, uh, gets, sits itself under the wing of the Portuguese and later of the Spanish state uh, and creates uh, slave plantation, slave work plantation colonies uh, in, uh, on Atlantic islands off the coast of Africa. And of course then uh, Genoese financed uh, Portuguese colonial operations are the, tri are the starting point through Brazil of the uh, Atlantic and uh, Brazil and the Caribbean of the Atlantic slave trade, which is then taken over successively by the Dutch and by the English and so on and so on and so on. So standing inequality uh, is something which capitalist imperialism routinely creates. And it in order to understand imperialism, therefore, we need some way of holding, thinking the relationship between the state and the, um, uh, and the political economy. Now, I've spent more time on this introductory part than I intended to, but I will, I hope, go further. I take it first off uh, that a state in complete abstraction from uh, the class nature and so on, the state is an armed gang which has a sufficient preponderance of organized military force in a certain territory as to be able to extract taxes and thereby maintain itself. This is, Weber famously defines the state as having monopoly of the legitimate use of force. Obviously, if you say the state has a monopoly of the use of force, no state exists anywhere in the world and the United States is not a state. Uh, even if you say the monopoly of the legitimate use of force, the United States is not a state. Um, uh, uh, furthermore, if you say you know, the majority of the legitimate use of force is supposed to distinguish between uh, 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 states and private actors. Uh, it's not clear why the hell we should say that the activities of the German state are legitimate, those of the Red Army fraction are not, or for that matter, the, of the Peruvian state are legitimate, those of Sendero Luminoso are not. So the, the Weberian account is useless, but the under, understanding the state as being a state, a body which is capable of extortion through in the form of tax, uh, does enable us to distinguish between a, 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 a state and as yet a, um, a, a, a and as yet an unsuccessful in, insurgency or a extortion racket which is tolerated by some state like the mafia. Yeah. Secondly, looking from another angle, a state is a specialization of function. We Marxists usually talk about division of labor when we mean specialization of function. That is that some, somebody keep, does the same job over and over again forever. So it's a specialization of function um, in which state actors are paid for work in the public sphere. And the public sphere is something which inherently appears as the necessary other of private property. It's the necessary other of private property, the whole raft of ways in which it's the necessary other of private property. The most obvious, however, is that there have to be public ways and spaces. Because if there are no public ways and spaces, you can't access your private property. Yeah. But it's equally the case that the public ways and spaces, in order for your property to be any use, we need there to be bridges. There's a whole book called Bridges, Law and Power, which discusses uh, the development of bridges in the Middle Ages. Yeah. We uh, tend to underestimate uh, the importance of the density of infrastructure which was created in the European and Chinese Middle Ages. When we look at uh, uh, Russia by comparison, it's uh, incredibly superficial and lacking in that level of density of infrastructure because it's only got stuff constructed really in the 20th century. Um, and it's simply much less dense population. That's another issue. 
Um, but equally, the regime of private property itself is a commons, is a, uh, a common activity of the whole society. Mm. Land is always, at any time since the last ice age, the ownership of land has been derived out of taking by a state or collective group from some pre-existing uh, 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 hunter-gatherer or um, pastoralist or uh, whatever uh, society. The state functions are at the end of the day conservative. When we say it says the state, the state functions at the end of the day conservative in relation to the existing relations of production. They're designed, they're there, they're not designed, they're there to stop, prevent breakdown rather than there to cause innovation. Competition between private property owners, whether that competition takes the form of capitalist competition or landlord competition for followings uh, or uh, Roman aristos for clients or uh, whatever the hell it may be, is dri does drive innovation. Mm -hmm. Third point, the state is, has a preponderance of organized armed force. And in order to have that preponderance of organized armed force, it has to hold its soldiers back from looting. And equally, it has to hold its judges back from looting, its senior officers back from looting, et cetera. Because if it just breaks up into looting, the state collapses. This is just like the army, which breaks up in, wins the battle, breaks up in order to loot. The enemy regroups and comes back and kills them all. The state has to hold its officials back from looting. And in order to hold its officials back from looting, it has to have structure and ideology because it's not a family it's not a natural phenomenon it's a a, a, a made a state is a made thing mm -hmm. and that ideology ties it to uh, the existing um, class order when uh, various People, Katsky included, Katsky included, Engels included, Lenin included, said, actually, it doesn't matter what the form of the state is. It's just a, it's a question simply about the um, uh, uh, relations of production which lie under it. That's mistaken. And there is a profound difference between the forms of a feudal state and the forms of a capitalist state, or between the forms of a slaveholder urban state and the forms of a feudal state or of a capitalist state. And the older states have to be overthrown in order to create the capitalist state. So step the next, capitalism requires at an elementary level, both the exchange of commodities and money. And if we consider uh, social orders, pre-capitalist social orders, and indeed, actually, uh, a lot of local activities, etc., etc., etc. Neither the um, exchange of commodities nor money you know, is something which will naturally occur, naturally grow out of village society. The evidence which we have, it overwhelmingly supports, not in the sense that the uh, uh, Roman state is a gift exchange state or something like that, but the overwhelming evidence that we have from anthropology supports the proposition that local, uh, so local pre-state societies characteristically function at the level of gift exchange, which means that you don't. You try and give, give, uh, uh, give to your friend in order to put them under an obligation to give to them to give back to you into the future and but it's not we need to hold it at a level we need to hold it at a level because actually the underlying transactions are in money and the barter conception uh, is a but is a conception which responds to the antecedent existence not of uh, coined money, which is relatively late, but of money commodities, which appear uh, in uh, uh, ancient Mesopotamia, in uh, 
uh, the 2000s or thereabouts uh, uh, BC. Mm -hmm. So the state is, you can't have a uh, capitalist functionality without there being a state. Secondly, capitalism grows up under feudal states, but needs its own states. It requires its own states because first off, feudal states protect the property claims of landlords, peasants, and the church in ways which interfere with uh, uh, capitalist interests. Secondly, uh, the feudal state is a government of men and not of laws. Uh, it's based on the supposed um, nobility of the, uh, the king and the nobles and so on and so forth. And that nobility overrides. Uh, so we have endless stories of the lost heir who is brought up in dreadful circumstances, but shows through his true nobility uh, uh, and comes th through and becomes king. And of course, the Charles II was one of the um, examples, uh, was one of the people of whom that image of the lost heir was repeatedly used, but it was a really old one. It was the 13th century novels and poems were uh, heavily based on this image of the lost heir. The King Arthur story is a part in part a lost heir story and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the church equally, uh, the, the authority of the bishop is based on his supposed sanctity. And at any of these, these because of the personal authority, cronyism can jump in, the cronyism of the kings and it, king's mates can jump in and interrupt the circuit of capital and bankrupt the capitalist simply by virtue of, uh, oh, sorry, we already gave this out to a mate. Yeah. Uh, equally, the uh, supposed sanctity of the bishop can some some church law is extensively uh, debatable. Um, uh, but uh, some bishop can come along and say, oh, this your this transaction is usurious. So there's instability uh, in a, uh, a feudal re state regime which interferes with capitalism. I've written at more length on this stuff in the uh, Constitution series uh, uh, last autumn. Thirdly, uh, feudal states are characteristically actually nation states. You know, they, the, the kingdom of the Franks, the kingdom of the English, the kingdom of the Germans. Um, Capitalism needs, grows up in merchant shipping and it needs navalism as part of the institutional forms of the state. This is already very visible, again, ben Venice and Genoa, but equally in the Dutch Republic and England. It needs to be a state which aspires to a global reach. The Dutch Republic, uh, the Venice and Genoa don't aspire, to, they aspire to a a reach in so far as the world as they understood it at the time. <laughs> but uh, the Dutch Republic uh, colonizes Taiwan, Malacca, uh, the Sri Lanka, the um, into large part of Indonesia, a uh, chunk of Brazil. They don't in the end manage to hold on to Brazil, but they still keep Suriname. Uh, the British, the British Empire, the, the, the story is absolutely obvious. Mm. The capitalist state is a constitutional state rather than a national state. It's based on, we are the, the state of the constitution. That's actually the nature of the British. It, we, it, it's a bit hidden from us, but it's actually the nature of the British ideology uh, all through the um, 18th century and the imperial period, it, uh, it, it Britishness as such is, becomes more of an ideology as opposed to British constitutionalism um, uh, in the, uh, the 20th century. The state is a permanent debtor. It finances itself through borrowing from uh, institutional markets. 
The state is a rule of law state, not a government of men state. The consequence then of all of this stuff, the, the state originates as a joint stock venture of the bourgeois revolutionaries. They need to take control away from the bishops and king and the um, uh, landed aristocracy. And in order to take control away from them, they need to borrow money. And in order to borrow that money, they secure it by mortgaging the tax take, the future tax take uh, to the creditors. So the, 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 the state then is a firm. Uh, it's a joint stock. It's the, 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 not my new idea. This is Edmund Burke's comment uh, way back in the 1780s. Uh, the state is in essence a joint stock company like a, and the uh, people who have property in the state are the shareholders in the company or alternatively the creditors of the company. The state is therefore always dependent on particular capitals, its creditors, its local bribe payers. Um, and as the producers of military material, a state, remember back at the beginning, a state is always a military actor. And a state therefore is dependent on the producers of military material, military uh, uh, weapons and uh, logistical supply, logistical supplies, and so on and so forth. Mm. And in particular, it's dependent on uh, the producers of military material in its territory, because a state which is dependent on importing uh, military material from some other state uh, is going to be cut off by that other state at some point in uh, uh, in the uh, foreseeable future. Uh, uh, if it does anything against the wishes of that state. FX, just to take an example, um, uh, uh, the United States put some effort into um, uh, sabotage of uh, British uh, uh, rocket experimentation in the 1960s um, because they didn't want the British state. They wanted the British state to be dependent on the United States for ICBMs. Um, and as things has gradually developed, the British arms industry has been wound down. The British state has become increasingly directly dependent on the United States. Now, if, if Britain, as long as Britain is willing to do exactly what the United States wants, that's fine. But suppose Britain wanted, let's say, to invade France for some reason, uh, the United States would just say, sorry, you can't have any ammunition. Okay. British invasion of France would last for a couple of weeks. We've seen this, in fact, happen with the Israeli state uh, in Yom Kippur War, uh, in the uh, first Israeli intervention in Lebanon, uh, in the Israeli intervention in Lebanon in 2006, and in Operation Cast Lead, or in each of these, at some point after the beginning of the operation, the United States says, we've had enough, you have, we're turning off the supplies and the Israeli state has to back off. Okay, so we start with, we, with these fundamentals to try and reformulate questions of uh, state capital relations. And I start with the proposition, there is not a general rate of profit. Contrary to capital three, there is not a general rate of profit. Marx's argument in Capital Three for a general rate of profit is unsound because the argument is there is a tendency for capitals to pursue the highest rate of profit, which will tend therefore towards producing uh, equalization. Mm -hmm. In the long run, uh, rates of profit will equalize, uh, but uh, 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 and therefore for the purpose of simplification, we can assume that rates of profit have equalized. But that's actually the same thing as saying, in the long run, everybody's dead. All organisms will die. And therefore, we can assume for the purpose of simplification that we do biology on the basis that all organisms are dead. Or in the long run, uh, entropy tends to a maximum. And therefore, we should assume that entry has already, entropy has already, a, 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 it's an unacceptable argument. And Engels was perfectly clear that it was an unacceptable argument. He offered an alternative argument for it, which was that um, 
uh, full capitalism involved the corporation and that the corporation then involved the principle of equal division of uh, profits. But actually that doesn't work either because the corporate corporations uh, don't involve, corporations involve complex profit sharing structures which, are, which don't work on the basis of a principle of equality. What's really going on uh, is that the state borrowing structure creates the financial markets which we know and the consequence of the financial markets which we know is that capital is revalued upwards and downwards relative to the return on government securities and the consequence of that is to do the jobs which Marx made the general rate of profit do which is to say that uh, productive capitalism affects uh, the rate of return and thereby affects um, that we get a, an idea of a necessary general rate of return which affects rents and uh, what they call merchant profit, profit which is misleading which is actually speculator profit yeah, and the, the rate of interest. There's a converse aspect of this which is that uh, the costs of running the state are a debt if we think of a corporation, a corporation has debt that is borrowed so much money from the bank or from uh, bondholders yeah. and uh, equity, which is its shareholders to whom it pays dividends out of profits. The cost of the state is a debt charge like the bondholders on the capitalist economy, not a, uh, a distribution of profit. Yeah. It has to be paid come rain come shine. There are consequences of this stuff in relation to capitalist dynamics in general. First off, capitalism drives towards sharpening and ever sharpening polarization of rich and poor. Relatively small number of people get very rich, lots and lots of people get relatively poor. Mm -hmm. The tendency towards polarization in capitalism is much stronger than the equivalent. There is an equivalent tendency in feudalism and in classical antiquity, but the tendency in capitalism is a great deal stronger. Mm. But polarization is antagonistic to the interests of the state. It undermines the state's uh, military effectiveness, its power as a state. It undermines its political authority as a as, as representing the public, the general public good and so on and so forth. And in consequence, we get state anti-polarization measures, uh, state operations in relation to the poor laws, in relation to um, state-sponsored education, state-sponsored uh, welfare operations. Um, again, all the way back to the Italian uh, the Italian city-states. This is something which is an in state. The state operations are an innovation um, relative to uh, feudalism proper in which the uh, uh, welfare operations are almost entirely the church in operation. Um, secondly, uh, cycles. If we disregard the general rate of profit, uh, the tendency to the return of the business cycle of um, gradual growth slump, gradual growth up to a peak, tailing off crash, slump, gradual growth, etc. Sawtooth, sigmoid sawtooth, a pattern of business cycles. This pattern of business cycles started in 1763 or thereabouts in the 1760s in essence. Um, in Britain, it became generalized into uh, Europe and the United States in the mid 19th century. Uh, there's some destabilization of it in the uh, 20th century, both because of the consequences of World War I and then uh, because after World War II, uh, there's a more or less general adoption of financial repression and um, it, it, what's called stop go interventions to stop the top of the boom developing, cut off the top of the boom and then counter interventions to uh, reduce the depth of the slump. Um, doesn't mean there are in fact sigmoid sawtooth cycles in quite a lot of the colonial countries, but um, 
in the imperialist countries and the colon states like Australia and New Zealand um, that 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 doesn't uh, that, that 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 that's managed. Okay, but the consequence of cycles in a free capitalist order would be uh, monopolization. And it would be monopolization on an international scale so that uh, the uh, 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 e e firms go bust and uh, capital is centralized, but capital is centralized in the hands of Uh, FX, uh, Ford winds up owning all the uh, car, the whole of the car industry. That's not a, it's not a great example because we're, we are actually quite a long way towards that. There are a small number of um, car firms which own most of the car industry and a lot of things which are brands, which aren't actually, don't represent independent ownership. Um, but the problem is, again, back to a state is, is, in terms of its military capability, dependent on having arms producers, car producers, uh, 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 infrastructure, etc., in its own territory. Letting the market rip in terms of the crash mm -hmm. uh, undermines the functioning of the state. So every state is incentivized to rescue, quote, its capitals. Most recently, we've been doing it by large scale money printing. Um, but the result of the state intervention is that the cycles get slowed. Um, we get the phenomenon that Marxists notoriously over predict cycles, that we expect there's going to be a crash, but in reality, actually state interventions work sufficiently to slow down the process and to uh, avert crash for greater or less a period of time. Um, capitalist development incentives are blunted, so the old technologies persist. I worked for nine months at a firm called Metal Box in Hackney, um, manufacturing tin cans and um, the, the presses which we worked on uh, were uh, presses from 1914, 1915 and 1916 which had been bought from American tin can companies by uh, whoever the hell the company was that, that, that owned that uh, factory in Hackney at that time but had been kept running okay converted from being uh, steam driven to being uh, electricity driven, but uh, the old tech is kept running. And that was absolutely characteristic of the British engineering industry and of the British textiles industry. If you go back to the Netherlands in the 19th century, um, they were very slow to adopt the steam engine uh, and uh, very slow to adopt coal. They kept using peat as a primary form of uh, uh, heating and uh, uh, windmills and water mills continued to be uh, primary motive power. Uh, and uh, they were significantly later. Um, so that the, the old tech carries on. I think, think it's almost certainly the case that there are features of the modern United States economy which display the same uh, characteristic. Um, Thirdly, in this context, we have to think about if we say there isn't a general rate of profit, the consequence of it is we can think specifically about what the effects of the existence of capitalist consumption sectors. Um, capitalist cap profit is either reinvested uh, or it's applied to agency costs, which means to say paying premium salaries to the uh, middle classes of one sort and another. Mm -hmm. um, and that we can leave that out because then what the middle classes do it, do with it, they have they either reinvest it, which is they save it, which means they reinvest get take, goes back into reinvestment, or else they just uh, consume it in some way, which takes us back to our other consumption sectors. The arms industry, 
uh, the, it, the, the payments to the arms industry all have to come out of surplus, it's surplus product in, at the end of the day, uh, because it's not innovating, it's not making more things, as it were, for human consumption. Uh, uh, and uh, the luxury goods and services sector. And they have different consequences. The arms industry you know, just works like uh, uh, any other industry, apart from the fact that it's all coming out of the, the input for it is the pay, payment for it is all coming out of surplus. And it has perfectly conventional multiplier effects. But then if you think about two states and you've got Ruritania buys arms from West Atlantica, Britain buys arms from the United States, there will be multiplier effects in the United States of the purchase of arms. Uh, and uh, a squeeze on um, demand in the UK because the uh, money is going out of the UK to pay for arms in the United States. The same true, of course, for uh, 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 Saudi purchases of arms from the US and Britain and so on and so on and so on. Same is true in a different way. So the, the luxury goods and services sector is different, but has similar effects if we think about it from state point of view, um, because luxury goods and services is an innovative, an in incubator of innovations. Um, FX, all this uh, IT stuff all started uh, largely as uh, luxuries when it went into civil production out of the armed forces, it went where it became largely luxuries. Sugar was a luxury, cotton was a luxury, uh, and so on and so on and so on. So that uh, uh, having a large luxury goods sector is going to produce a, 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 um, a stronger general economy and is also going to have counter polarization and counter cyclical effects. So as soon as we assume many states, suppose this was my, at the end of the day, my most fundamental point, and I'm going to run, I'm sorry, I'm run on so long, but it, I am going to come to an end. Mm -hmm. yeah. Assume many states which are more or less equal to start with. This is a total obvious counterfactual, it's never been the case. In reality, actually, when we talk about petty commodity production, that was also a counterfactual. Petty commodity production always existed together with um, uh, industrial operations in the form of uh, church building, um, uh, 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 large uh, landlord levies to do um, uh, 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 road building and uh, hedging and ditching and bridge repairs and so on and so forth. So that it was never the case that there was a, an economy which consisted of petty commodity production. In the same case, where well, there is never, there's never, never has never been and never will be a flat world. But imagine a flat world if for exactly the same reason that, as Marx argues in the first part of Capital One, if you had Proudhon's image of uh, a world of independent commodity producers, slight, the market itself would amplify slight differences between them and it, they would sort into a hierarchy. And capital would emerge out of that counterfactual petty commodity production. Mm -hmm. The same is true if we imagine a flat world of uh, states which were approximately equal. Uh, radical inequality between states would naturally emerge just by virtue of the fact that the states, because of their character as capitalist states, have to jostle for power and hierarchical position among them. And that jostling for power and hierarchical position among states is not, contrary to Capitalism in general, you can say, is um, a positive sum game during boom periods, which cycles into a negative sum game in slump periods, but net overall is a positive sum game down to the point where we are now, where um, uh, the continued uh, capitalist growth is going to um, poison the world. Yeah. Um, but relations between states is a zero-sum game. 
because states are a body which deals in authority in who tells who what to do. So that the competition between capitalist states is inherently a zero sum game. It inherently sorts those states into a hierarchy. But it's also the case that the, uh, it, the hierarchy is uh, not as simply as this, but roughly a greasy pole. The hegemon state can't stay at the top. The hegemon state can't stay at the top because because it is the hegemon state, it becomes the reserve currency state. Investment in, as of 17th century, investment in the Netherlands uh, is safer than investment anywhere else, but has lower returns than investment anywhere else. So we get an inflow of investment into the Netherlands and an outflow of investment from the Netherlands, and we get uh, a, a, a tendency, particularly for real property prices, to rise. That's actually something which is very much observed by contemporaries, that real property prices are massively higher in 17th century Amsterdam than in 17th century London. The rise of real property prices implies that as a, as a factory owner, you have to borrow more money in order to buy a factory or pay more rent in order to rent a factory, but equally also that you have to pay more to your workers because it ain't the case. You know, if the work, I said this in this week's article, if the workers can't live anywhere, they can't work. Mm -hmm. So there's a tendency therefore, inherent tendency to the offshoring of production and for the hegemons, the economy of the hegemon state to become financialized. And that's visible again. Uh, 17th century Venice and Genoa engaged in making desperate efforts to try and reindustrialize and get back their shipping industries, which they're losing to the Dutch and the English. Yeah. And desperately concerned about how the, the, the country is declining into a mere financial uh, operation, financial center. The Netherlands, exactly the same, 18th century Netherlands, late 18th century Netherlands, desperate efforts to overcome the problem that the country's become a mere financial sector place. Late 19th, early 20th century Britain, uh, Ashley, who's a uh, uh, um, political economist, terrible problem. Britain is suffering the fate of the Netherlands, and the same actually with Hobson's discussion of um, imperialism. Britain is suffering the fate of the Netherlands. It's becoming a purely financial se se sector place. So the, the declining hegemon power remains militarily dominant and financially dominant, although it's losing its industrial dominance. And the consequence of retaining is that it's driven to increasingly aggressively assert its military and financial dominance to exact tribute from the rest of the world. But considering um, that, 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 that increasing aggression is going to produce uh, attempts of others to uh, develop themselves as rivals. And the tendency to offshoring is also going to produce a tendency for the uh, places to which the this production is offshored to begin to develop themselves as rivals. The, the dominant power can go on extracting tribute from the rest of the world for a considerable period of time after it has ceased to be industrially dominant. UK ceased to be industrially dominant around the 1850s, but continued to be able to extract tribute from the rest of the world down to 1940, including the in interwar period. Mm -hmm. And the depth of the depression in the United States after 1929 compared to much shallower repression in the UK reflected the extent to which the UK extracted financial tribute from the rest of the world. But finally, at the end of the day, uh, 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 the uh, creature is knocked off its perch. And at the point at which the creature is knocked off its perch, uh, it has to be knocked off its perch by full scale war. It can't be knocked off its perch just by being disadvantaged in some. It has to be something on the scale of 
uh, the destruction of the British uh, government's uh, geostrategic uh, arrangements as a result of the fall of France and the fall of Norway in 1940. Uh, the French invasion of the Netherlands in uh, the uh, 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 wars, successive uh, nine years war and war of the uh, Spanish succession. Um, uh, uh, Venice is effectively knocked off its perch by wars with the Ottomans and for big force to come under the wing of the Spanish. Um, so my point, I guess, which underlies all of this stuff, if we think carefully about um, the underlying relationships between the state and the core of the political economy of capitalism, we will wind up with the conclusion that actually both imperialism and war and the cycle of rising and declining hegemons are all inherent in the nature of capitalism. Uh, they're not uh, the idea of uh, peaceful capitalism is a uh, delusion. A non-imperialist capitalism is, is, is a delusion. That's it.